I'm Sebastian St. James. So far on this channel, this one ETF has outperformed all the others. <laughs> this is the NASDAQ 100. In a previous video, one of my viewers asked, so obvious question to ask, is there an index in the world that outperforms the NASDAQ over a long time period? Great video as always. Thank you, sir. And thank you, sir. Challenge accepted. Can I find an ETF that outperforms the NASDAQ 100? It's quite a challenge, but a challenge I'm up to. So how to approach this? First thing, let's narrow it down to country. This is Vanguard Australian Shares Index ETF, VAS, or the ASX 300. That's what you'd know it as. This is IVV, which is the iShares S&P 500 ETF. Australia versus the US. Let's start to graph the two and see how they line up. Firstly, VAS is in the red and green. That's the Australian index. And IVV, which is the American index, is in pure black. Just like their hearts. And it starts off and all the red and green is in front. That's Australia and red and green stays in front. They're dipping down quite a lot. And oh, yeah, there we go. America almost overtook Australia, but Australia actually wins in the end. Hooray! So over the one year, Australia wins. I seem to be missing something. Oh, the NASDAQ. This video is about the countries and which is the better country. I mean, that's what I'm using to find the better ETF. But of course, we may as well include the NASDAQ because that's what the comparison ultimately is based on. So here it is. NASDAQ is in purple. This is the NASDAQ 100. And over the one year we find, oh, the NASDAQ is down the bottom, the NASDAQ is down the bottom, and the NASDAQ remains down the bottom. Apparently Australia is too powerful for the NASDAQ. Over two years we find, well, black, which is the S&P 500 is up the top, it's up the top, and it remains up the top. Oh, there we go. So over the two years, US wins. 50% of the time it was Australia. That's not a bad start. Over the three years, purple, which is the NASDAQ, kind of starts off in front, yeah, and it's in front, and it's in front, and it remains, oh, actually, I don't know. Could be anything. It's a photo finish. Bring in the scrutineers. I need to zoom in and have a better look at this. And there it is, that's zoomed in. That is black, uh-huh. So black is not the NASDAQ, is it? No. Black is IVV, which is the S&P 500. So over the three years, we find the US has won again. Not looking so good for Australia. Let's go back to five years. We find purple, which is the NASDAQ, is in front. It is in front and it remains in front. Oh, very good. No confusion there at all. So over the five years, well, the NASDAQ wins. The NASDAQ belongs to the US and so the US wins, but we'll specifically say it is the NASDAQ. So I've proven the following. Over, well, at least five years, the US outperforms Australia. If I want to find an ETF that outperforms the NASDAQ 100, Australia is probably not the place to look, unless you're looking for, say, lithium mining stocks or something like that, some little micro specialized ETF. But if we're looking in broader senses, I need to get rid of the didgeridoo and go over to the US. The S&P 500, US is full of super caps. I mean, as far as the market goes, the Australia is this small and the US is, well, it's kind of like massive. The question in my mind is the S&P 500, the largest 500 stocks on the US market, what's the smallest of those? And how would that compare, say, to the ASX 200? Where would it actually fit in? The smallest stock in the S&P 500 is at number 503, News Corp Class B shares. There will be Class A as well, but this is the smallest individual stock. And what size is News Corp? Very small when they come to their morals. Oh, no, sorry, that was not the question. It turns out to be $10.21 billion, which is still a fairly sizable company, let's face it. The NASDAQ 100, its smallest company is at number 102. If you're worried about why these ETFs have more stocks in them than their actual number, it's because of the Class A and Class B shares. We've seen an example of that already. Which is NetEase, symbol NTES. Its size is 46.66 billion. Aha, uh -huh, that appears to be larger to me. That's their smallest caps. We're going to compare that to the ASX in a moment. The question is, what is the largest cap stocks in both of these cases? Well, the largest in the S&P 500 is Apple, double A-P-L. It has a $2.13 trillion in US. If you're counting, your calculator may not be able to go that high. 
The Nasdaq 100, the largest company, is, oh, also Apple. Well, it's pretty obvious. Apple is a tech stock. It was always going to be in the Nasdaq 100. Is it possible that if something else rose, say a finance company, that it would actually be in the S&P 500, but not number one on the Nasdaq? Yes, that's exactly how that would work. But it is not the case at the moment. So the market caps for these two indices, the S&P 500 goes from $10 billion right up to $2,130 billion. The Nasdaq 100 is actually slightly larger. It goes from $46 billion up to $2,130 billion. $10 billion is the smallest on the S&P 500. Where would that fit in with the ASX? Would it be right up the top? Would we be right down the bottom? In the middle? Let's find out. First of all, we need to convert over to Australian dollars. 10.21 billion, which is the smallest company on the S&P 500, is 15 billion, 242 million, 896,980 dollars. If you want to know all the digits. Now, where does that fit in in the ASX? So 15.2 billion, that fits in right there. This is the center group. Center group is basically the same size as the smallest company on the S&P 500. What is center group? Center Group owns and operates an extraordinary platform, if they do say so themselves, of 42 Westfield living centres. Westfield as in Westfield shopping centres? Yes, that's exactly what they own. This is Suncorp. Suncorp is too small to fit in the S&P 500. It's the next company down in size. And this is their website and it appears that Suncorp is a scam. Oh, hang on. Scam warning. Suncorp Bank customers should be alert to receiving messages or calls claiming to be from our fraud team asking them to transfer money or share passwords. My mistake. Fancy assuming that insurance was a complete scam. So what does Suncorp own? You may or may not know the name itself. What actually brands do they have? They have AMI, GIO, Bingle Insurance, Shannon's, You've most likely heard of some of these insurance brands. Perhaps you even have insurance policies with them right now. And yet Suncorp is too small to fit in to the S&P 500. <laughs> so there's a lot of companies that we'd consider to be fairly large companies here in Australia that are too small over in the US. So it comes to my mind, should we not be focusing on those companies? Maybe these actually have some amazing growth potentials. The question is, is there an ETF that covers companies of this size, perhaps even smaller, and is it a good investment? This is IJR. This is the iShares S&P Small Cap ETF. Aha! But aren't small caps dangerous? That sounds to me like penny stocks. But maybe if you've got a whole index full of them, like 500, 600 of them, then the dangers would all even out. I mean, that's why we hold index funds in the first place, isn't it? So what does IJR do? It gives you exposure to small US companies. The fund aims to provide investors with the performance of the S&P small cap 600. Aha, that is the index which IJR is entirely based on. So what is the S&P 600 small cap index? The S&P small cap index is a stock market index established by Standards & Poor's. Well, obviously that's what the S&P part is. It covers roughly the small cap range of American stocks using a capitalized weighted index. So far, so good. What does IJR actually hold? This is IJR, the Australian version, and unsurprisingly, it just outright holds the US version. Yeah, very original, but that's its purpose. It's doing its job. Fine. What does the US version hold? Well, the US version holds, oh, cash. Lots of it. It's largest single holding, I kid you not, I'm not making this up. It's largest single holding of the IJR in the US is cash. It appears to have $1.1 trillion of it. The largest holding besides cash is ADC, Agree Realty REIT Corp, Ensign Group, etc. and down the list. Should I be worried about an ETF that mostly holds cash? Well, it doesn't mostly hold cash as a percentage. It's more reasonable, but a single largest holding is cash. Yes, personally, I'm a bit concerned about that. That's not the way I want to go. If I want to invest in cash, I'll invest in cash. It's fairly straightforward, but that's what this particular ETF holds. Now we have our three ETFs, which is small caps, IJR, the NASDAQ, NDQ, and the S&P 500, which is IVV. Let's look at the Australian versions of those three. Well, here they are. IVV, the iShares S&P 500 ETF. It has a management fee of 0.04%, fairly reasonable. Is it Australian domiciled? Well, yes, effective the 7th of September 2018, it became Australian domiciled. 
This is NDQ. It is a BetaShares NASDAQ 100 ETF. It has a management fee of only 0.48. Only, really. It's like 10 times larger than any other ETF we'll look at today, but that's it. Only 0.48. And importantly, you do not need to complete a W8 Ben form. That means it is Australian domiciled. This is IJR, the iShares S&P small cap ETF. It has a management fee reasonable. See? 0.07%. Yes, that's acceptable to me. In the second half of 2018, it became Australian domiciled. Very good. So here is a comparison. IVV, NDQ and IJR. All Australian domiciled, obviously covering totally different things, all covering the US, incidentally, large cap, tech cap, and small cap, and well, with a management fee of 0.48. What can I say? So let's get to some graphing. Here it is. The IJR will be in red and green. NDQ, which is the NASDAQ, will be in black. And IVV, which is the S&P 500, will be in purple. This is the one-year graph. We find IJR is up the top, it is up the top still, and it finishes up the top. Yes, there we go. So over the one year, IJR wins. Oh, this is easy. Discover a brand new ETF and suddenly it wins. Over the two years, IJR is up the top, it is up the top, and no, no, it's going down and, uh, well, I don't know, it's a photo finish. Bring in the scrutineers. Well, it is purple. Yes, I'd say that. Purple is IVV. Uh -huh. So over the two years, IVV is the winner. So much for small caps. Good in the one year, not so good in the rest. Over five years, we notice black is in front. That is the NASDAQ. Oh, that's a change. NASDAQ is in front, NASDAQ in front, and NASDAQ remains in front. Oh, well done. So over the five years, NASDAQ wins. Now keep in mind that this is actually the graph X dividend, well, without dividends at least, is that a problem? Well, yes and no. If the actual graphs are really, really close, you know, or whisker away from each other, the dividends will totally make sense. Then you have to add in the dividends. It absolutely makes a difference. If one is double what the other is, no, the dividends are completely irrelevant. So far, we've looked at five years. To look back further, I need to switch programs and go over to the US. What's in the US? Well, we have the equivalent of those, but they've been around for a lot longer. For some of these, it's fairly straightforward. The Australian version just holds the US version, so I step across the pond to the US version. IJR, the Australian version, straight up holds the US version. That's really easy to do. IVV, which is the S&P 500, straight up holds the US version, but NASDAQ does not. This is the Australian version, NDQ. It holds, oh, directly, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon. Well, hang on, why is that? Why does NDQ not hold the US version of it? Because there is no US version of it. You see, BetaShares is an Australian provider of exchange-traded funds. Therefore, <laughs> it's no American version for it to be holding. The question is, why do not some of the large US providers of ETFs come to Australia and set up a NASDAQ and compete? That, you'll have to go and ask them. So what do I do? Well, relax. The NASDAQ is actually covered. It will be a different fund, but it is typically covered by the QQQ, and that's been around forever. So it will be in the US, IJR versus IVV versus the QQQ, which is the NASDAQ 100 replacement. Invesco QQQ, exchange rate of fund that tracks the NASDAQ 100 index. There it is in writing. Now I'm living in the US as far as ETFs are concerned. How far can I go back in time? It appears that the small cap ETF, which is the IJR, has existed from May 22, 2000. Not that long ago, 22 years. The S&P 500 has existed from May 15, 20,000. Well, hang on, that's basically almost the same date. And the NASDAQ 100 has existed a slightly longer, from 1999. Not so long as you would expect. So how can I compare the three if they've started at different dates? Well, I go to the one that's the shortest period of time when all three existed. When was that? That was from May 22, 2000, and that's the date we'll take. So only 22 years, hasn't the S&P 500 been around for longer than that? Well, yes, it has. The thing is, we're looking at ETFs and ETFs themselves have not been around forever. I know it'll come as a shock to you, particularly if you're younger, but the fact is they haven't. What is the history of ETFs? Well, the world's first ETF ever was created in Canada. Okay, not in the US, in 1990. 
So if you're born after 1990, I have two questions for you. Can you tie your shoes without your mother's help? And secondly, did you know that you never lived in a world without ETFs? It's amazing. Well, what was there before ETFs? There was mutual funds. And that's what invested in these. So these indexes have been around for a long time. And the mutual funds have been around for the long time. But guess what? Mutual funds do not actually trade on any of the exchanges. And therefore, getting their data is next to impossible. But we do have data from the ETF, so let's use that. From the 16th of December 2012 up to, to the 2022. Okay, so this is 10 years. Well, here we go. And our colors are a bit different, right? IJR, which is the small caps, is going to be in dark blue. IVV, S&P 500 is going to be in purple. And QQQ, which is the NASDAQ 100, is going to be in green. Well, they start off, NASDAQ is in front, NASDAQ is in front, and NASDAQ remains in front. There we go, that was easy. So over the 10 years, which is what this graph was, NASDAQ 100 is the winner. And I can just add that to our history that we've discovered so far. December 2002. Oh, so it's 20 years. Green is in front, yes. Ooh, that's a NASDAQ, right. Green is in front and green is in front and green remains in front. There we go. So over the 20 years, NASDAQ 100 is the winner. You're noticing a distinct pattern here. At the beginning, it was the S&P 500. NASDAQ has not done well lately. But from year five onwards, it's NASDAQ, NASDAQ, NASDAQ. So far, I've gone back 20 years. We know about 22 years, all these ETFs actually existed. Let me find the exact date and do a graph on that. So here it is, the 22nd of May, 2000. This is when they all existed, the very day up till today. Uh, boo, blue is in front, what's blue? Well, blue is a small caps, aha. Uh -huh. IJR is in front, IJR is in front, and IJA wins. Wow, okay, that was a bit unexpected. Wasn't it like NASDAQ, NASDAQ, NASDAQ? Yes, and then suddenly the small caps came up and beat everybody. Is that likely? I don't know, that's what the graph shows. So over the entire comparable history, that means when the three ETFs existed, IVV returned 173%, NASDAQ returned 233%, and IJR, which is the small caps, returned 474%. So let's add that to our history list. Over the 22-year period, or 22 and a half, the S&P 600 small caps actually won. So H-Man, an obvious question, is there an index in the world that outperforms the NASDAQ over the long period of time? The answer is yes. And there's your answer. IJR, which is the small caps, has actually outperformed the NASDAQ over its entire lifetime. But it's not as simple as that. And I'm going to investigate this further because that little graph hopped up there out of nowhere and I'm very suspicious of that. So if we look, just within the period of two years, if I believe these graphs, the graph at the top is exactly 20 years to today. And green wins and we find green is NASDAQ. Go down exactly two years later, and blue, which is IJR, small cap, wins. Short sure, NASDAQ is above, and then we got the S&P 500 below, but really, in two years, it sort of just magically came out of nowhere. So, 20 years, the NASDAQ wins. It's one all ahead of that. And exactly 22 years, suddenly the IJR wins. Let's jump in the middle. Let's go to year 21. Who's winning right there? Well, here it is, 21 years exactly. Blue, which is small caps, is up in front. Oh no, see, the NASDAQ comes and beats it because NASDAQ is in green. So weird. Okay, so at the 20 year mark, NASDAQ wins. And at the 21 year mark, NASDAQ wins. A year and a half later, no, we find the small caps come from nowhere. The thing about ETFs is they try to replicate the index. They're not exactly the index themselves. They have to actually go out and buy the stocks or heavens forbid, actually use futures and swaps to track it. <laughs> Maybe there was some implementation error that caused this to be an issue. The only way to find out is to get rid of the ETFs. Go back to the underlying indices upon which they are based and compare the indices directly. Let's do that. So here it is. This is the S&P 600, which is the small cap index. That will be in blue. In purple will be the NASDAQ 100. In green will be, well, it's a funny symbol, but that's the S&P 500. Blue, which is a small cap, is in front, and blue is in front, and blue is in front. Oh, there it is. It is true. Over the history of the IJR, now we're looking at the indices themselves, it is true, small caps have beaten the NASDAQ on that exact date. So there was actually no problems with the ETFs at all. Weird. But there you go. That's the facts. Does this mean that if I keep going back in history, because I'm dealing with the indices now, I can actually go back before the ETFs, that we'll find that small caps will keep winning? Well, I don't know. We'll have to go and find out. Let's go back exactly five years from today. 
First of all, it's purple is in front, which is the NASDAQ 100. Interesting. All blue comes up there, which is the small caps. And no, it is purple. Yes, purple wins. That is the NASDAQ 100. If I go 20 years, it's the NASDAQ 100. 25 years, it's the NASDAQ 100. And, you know, one year right in the middle of that, no, it was the small caps. But that's not important to me because I deal with probabilities. And if IJR only won for one year, that, to me, is not very replicatable. The question is, how far can the IJR index, which is the S&P 600, go back? Well, the S&P 600, the index was launched on October 28, 1994. So you bet I'm going to go back to that very date. And here it is, October 28, 1994, up till today. This is the entire history. We find purple, NASDAQ is in front, and NASDAQ is in front, and NASDAQ is in front, and it wins. There we go. It's fairly straightforward. So over 28 years, the entire history, we find that NASDAQ 100 is the winner. So there you go. We got excited there about small caps, but if you actually look back over the entire history of the index, not the ETF, the ETF, it actually shows that small caps wins. But if you go back further and concentrate on the index itself, no, the small caps hardly play any part at all. We found out over 28 years, because that's the period when all three indices existed, the NASDAQ 100 is greater, that means better performance, than the US small caps, which outperform the US large caps. And there we go, that's what the data showed us. So it appears the NASDAQ 100 is still the undisputed king. <laughs> there we go. Well, that was a good attempt. We actually found an ETF that outperformed. Would I convert everything from the NASDAQ over? No, because we went back further in time, didn't we? We actually went back 28 years rather than 22 and a half. The question still remains though, the original question, is there actually an ETF in Australia that actually over a long period of time consistently or enough outperforms the NASDAQ? Well, we gave small caps a go, no. The problem is there's a lot of ETFs in Australia, a huge amount. What, am I gonna go through every single one and make some sort of comparison to find out what's better than the NASDAQ 100? Well, certainly no other YouTube channel will. So this is probably something that only I can do. And I have to figure out how I get that amount of data and somehow distill it into what may be a series of videos, say three, four videos, as we try to clump together the various ETFs and find out how they can pair up with the NASDAQ 100. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on that. And then I'll need a little holiday. Now we've discovered the exciting things about the NASDAQ 100 and how it performed against the S&P 500. How would this actually perform in real life if you actually were to buy it and actually try to retire with it? That I've done a video on. Click here to find out.